broadcast so that no, no small business owner is responsible for health care because that really eats into your overheads quite a bit, uh, health care costs. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the third area is, is a wide variety of things, but the best way to describe it is that business owners are double taxed, mm -hmm. right? So your income and your revenue is the same thing. When you are a business under 30 million in revenue, you're the owner's income and revenue is the same stream, and it doesn't stretch two ways. So they get double tax. They have their employer tax, their employee tax, and then their own personal in income tax, right? So we need to create a tax credit system that would allow uh, business owners like Mia to have a much uh, decreased uh, tax on that uh, based on scalable scale, basically. So that is the trifecta that I would present, and then that allows for much more um, disposable income for the owner to provide for a $15 an hour. So um, that would probably add, probably between all three of those things, it would add another 20 to 30% uh, of uh, straight revenue available for to pay folks. That's awesome. I'm making a note, 20 to 30% more revenue. That's exciting. Um, speaking of healthcare, the next question was about healthcare costs being on the rise. So I know you touched on Medicare for All. If that doesn't pass, is there a gap plan? Yeah. Is there some other way? Yeah, well there's eight proposals out there right now for Medicare for All, and they uh, run the spectrum of, some have uh, a blend of private insurers still existing, um, and then Medicare for All being a, a, a basically a public option. Um, and I do believe in the next four years we're gonna get one of them passed. But I'm going to do a quick side uh, talk over to um, the Senate. We need to get four more senators um, that are Democrats in the Senate in order to pass Medicare for All. Or else this is all just a bunch of talk, right? Mm -hmm. So um, just know that, that if you can get on a Senate race in another state, because we're perfectly blue here, but others need help, please mm -hmm. do that. That will help us get Medicare for All. So those eight proposals, right, are a wide variety. Some of them are just straight Medicare for All, where it is the only available um, insurance mechanism for healthcare, right? Um, for me, um, I am preferring the ones where there is a full public option, single payer only, because it takes the onus off of all small businesses to provide any healthcare. It also provides for freelancers to be able to have their own insurance and not be tied to a job or a contract that they don't want to be tied to. Um, so Medicare for All is a, is a much more um, gig economy, 21st century economy type of tool um, whereas right now we're kind of living in the 20th-ish century <laughs> of for um, small businesses. So it's much more small business friendly to have Medicare for All on the books and for sole proprietors as well as um, contractors because then you're not tied to a job. Mm -hmm. That's great. I know a lot of us, I've been a freelancer before too and I've picked up Cobra and then I'm freelancing and I'm basically freelancing to pay for Cobra. So, <laughs> so. Can I ask a question about yeah. Medicare for sure. All? Currently, uh, there's Medicare supplemental plans yeah. for uh, every commercial. Right. Will Medicare be specifically paid out through the government, or will they parse out their services? That's a really good question. Their services so have, to yeah. United Healthcare. Mm -hmm. or yeah. So right Blue now, Cross as you yeah. know, United Healthcare and Blue Cross Blue Shield actually process and administer right. Medicare. There's right. just a known fact, right? So over, so in most of those plans, it's a gradual plan between some of them that's as short as two years, some of ten years. So um, I'll give you the Jaya call the Schakowsky um, proposal. Um, Jaya calls it around two, and um, Schakowsky's is around ten. They probably can be somewhere in the middle, and we will put it over in a gradual fashion from uh, United Healthcare and uh, and uh, Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield, so that we don't disrupt the economy. Of that so it will be brought over gradually. And I, I might add, just with Medicare for All, this is a really important point because when we rolled out Obamacare, part of the problem was, what is this thing? Yeah. Nobody understood it, right? So I would say we need to spend a good 18 months to two years describing what it is and what it isn't so people understand this is what, how I do this because it literally takes away all boundaries and obstacles. So right now there's all these entry points, right? of different things that we can you know, go to our insurer, and then we have to go to the specialty pharmacy, and then we have to go to the doctor, and then we have to go back to the insurer. So with Medicare for All, it's just this big open gate. You just go to your doctor, or you go to your pharmacy, and go. And there's no having to, okay, I have to add uh, Part D, or I have to add a supplement. It's just one large program, and you have one entry point, and you don't have to do all this research. Right now, and I'll give you an example, right? My mom and dad, on average, and they're both not well, um, they're fine, but they're not well, 
Um, they spend, I, we t- my sister and I are big into data, so we tallied it over a three month period. They spend about um, 12 hours, hours each week on the phone or researching things like how do I deal with part two? How do I deal with something? How do and, you know, and they're not dealing well. So just imagine how much fun that is, right? Um, or if you have uh, a autoimmune disease or a chronic condition, right? You're having to get on the phone and talk to all these different players and then check back with them and then check back again because we know how that works, right? Um, and I'll tell you, I have uh, I have a daughter with um, two chronic conditions and I am constantly on the phone with the specialty pharmacy. By the way, side note, Specialty pharmacy was an industry that, is, that was built as a result of Obamacare. Now, initially, Obamacare was a great idea, brought 20 million people on the roads, but now we have um, specialty pharmacies owned by United Healthcare and other insurance companies in combination with pharmaceutical companies. So two kind of evil characters got together and created evil, right? So now the specialty pharmacy is a middleman that is not necessary. It just was a built-in mechanism to address another revenue stream, right? So. So for me, if we get rid of those specialty pharmacies um, and the kind of the uh, covert operation that the pharmaceutical companies and the insurance companies have, we're going to be in a much more um, uh, open environment. It will be easier for everybody. Mm-hmm. Cool. Excellent. Um, some good plans. Does anyone else have questions before we move to the next section? Anyone else have questions about coverage? You mentioned you're a graduate student at the park. And you work, okay. yeah. and you work at the park? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what are some of the things that are affecting you as a graduate student when it comes to Medicare, when it comes to uh, employment, and when it comes to actually being able to live the same? Um, we're fortunate enough to have a pretty good insurance plan. I mean, it's a little expensive, but I, I, nothing comes to mind in terms of like, issues that are still in the Medicare. Nothing comes to mind. Is there, like, I know there's a lot of, a lot of uh, movements to unionize student workers because of the wage they get. Sometimes they don't get a good wage. Um, how do you feel about that as a, as a student uh, graduate school? Personally, I just think the rates are competitive. It's, uh, the rates are starting at $15 an hour, which is pretty good. I mean, they, they cap your hours, uh, but that's more to uh, not pull up resources on a few a select students and sort of spread it around. Um, so I would have no complaints with the call. If anything, I would, if you're doing a good job, I would say personally. And that varies from college to college, as we know, right? So yeah. that needs to call those. And the program, there are many colleges that it's the exact opposite yeah. going on. So, and that's why, as an example, at mm-hmm. University of Chicago, they wanted to unionize, which was really important, and have health care as part of their yeah. income, right? Um, so, um, so, so glad that you're at the call. My daughter's there, she's on her life. I love the call. Yeah, nice that's stuff. right. We're, we're fans. <laughs> um, right, but, but, other, but other colleges aren't as um, kind of uh, egalitarian. So, um, so we do have to look at that as part of the mix because um, grad students are not getting compensated properly and they are not living in, in a great tradition because they don't get great money. So, right. Nepal seems to be yeah. an outlier. And they're working just as hard as the rest of us are. So. We'll go right ahead. Until Medicare for All becomes a law. Yeah. Um, I, I am recently at the point, so I've been looking for, you know, to pick up coverage. Right. I honestly have gone to several <coughs>
but then the rest of them roll out different services demographically or what have you over time. Right. So I like Jan's plan. Um, I, but by the way, all of these will get tweaked and none of these will be right. up. But just to be clear, I always I caution everybody. I, mean, I was at a union meeting uh, not too long ago and they were really pressing me on it. I'm like, yeah, right now, Jive Health Plan feels right. I'm just telling you that that's not going to be the plan. <laughs> like, I'm just being real, you know. So, um, so, um, so yeah, you are absolutely right with that the dilemma of um, getting, if you were lucky enough to get the House, the Senate, and the, um, the uh, presidency all be blue, um, that won't be forever. Right. And, we get, and it's the same thing that Obamacare probably had, right? They shoved it all in in a 13-week period, mm -hmm. and but we didn't talk about what it was or what it was. We didn't do a communications plan. We didn't market it. Nobody understood it. And then it was in place, and then we were like, Oh, it's pretty good, and then they started um, eating away at the fringes um, with regard to um, uh, yeah, all the all the different subsidies on the state level. It could be great. So, so I agree with you. Let's front load it, but realistically, and again, I'm a phone rant, I'm a phone phone super realist. You know, like we can't get it all out anyway. Right, right. So we have to get the most important things out right away and have that be law the land. I'd almost like the law to be broken up into two pieces so that we can secure. The most important stuff first, and then the, the, the robot. Be, yeah. yeah. Any other questions for Marie before we move to the next topic? Okay. Cool. Um, the next one. So I'm going to skip around a little bit. There's a lot of concern about gentrification in this area, mostly because we see it just north, uh, just northeast of us. So like yeah. Hilson and Little Village are getting hit. Hilson particularly is getting hit pretty bad. Um, there's a lot of chains and franchises because of our proximity to the airport. Yeah. You'll see that rent gets driven up the closer you get to Midway. Absolutely. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And so to be a small business around here, like a Zoe's, you want to attract that airport traffic, yeah. but it's hard to do because, you know, folks don't leave that little perimeter of the airport. And now you've got, you know, the really big businesses downtown who are placing themselves in the airport proper. Yeah. You know, they're trying to do this whole Chicago thing for example. So that's a huge competitive issue. Um, couple that with the fact that you've got chains building up all around in Bedford Park and stuff like this, it's hard to be a business in the Southwest side right. when you are competing with national chains, when you are competing with, um, you know, the little goats of the world and right. the, the homegrown inns, which are small but not as small as the rest of us, right? right. Um, there's also the potential for those businesses to eventually displace us, which is part of the concern. The, the more that those businesses start to flex around the airport, the harder it becomes for the rest of us to stay put because the rents skyrocket. That's what right. we're seeing in Pilsen. Right. So is there, I guess my question is, how do we achieve sustainable, purposeful growth yeah. that allows us to compete? Right, so um, one of the first steps is doing what uh, Jamie and her colleagues have done is put together collectives. This is very common and it's the best practices in many urban areas, particularly around airports and, and hubs. And so what effectively you can do as a team, and you're just fledgling now, but I, I see your ability to do this very um, easily, is um, going to the hubs, both the train and um, the airport, um, and saying, we have this collective of businesses that is vital to the community, and we actually offer a different um, uh, product or set of services than all these chains do. Mm -hmm. And come together as a collective, put together a marketing package that can be presented at the airport, can be presented at trains, mm. um, because the because Metra, RTA, CTA, all of those organizations are actually very open to um, creating, and part of this is transportation um, deserts too, so let's yeah. address the business collective piece. So if the collective comes together, we're this powerhouse of all of these businesses up and down Archer, and by the way, you are literally, so Midway's right there, right here, you're just going to go left out of the airport, another left, and you're by all of these businesses on Archer Avenue. Um, but there is literally things in that kit. It's a map. It's a list. It mm. tells you how we're different from chains because that's the delineation. Because I know when I'm traveling or when others are traveling, whether it's for business or family, I don't necessarily want to sit in a chain. A lot of families don't want to sit in a chain. So I'd rather, much rather sitting at um, Zoe's here than I would be at a, at a Chili's. Chili's perfectly fine business, but I would choose, you know, I would make that choice. So by becoming a package and becoming a collective powerhouse um, with the transportation companies, that is important. Now, my transportation policy intersects with that question Ooh. very importantly. 
there are several transportation um, deserts in Illinois Creek. So there's a few along here. Archer doesn't have as many buses. In um, Bridgeport, there in McKinley Park, there are the 31st Street bus travel. And then in Will County, there are four or five deserts in that mm -hmm. some of your train stops only have two or three trains in it, right? right. Mm -hmm. So if we add trains, two things happen. Our transportation rate goes up. Right now, Illinois Creek, sadly, um, <coughs> only has a 10% public transportation participation. So if we bring, and then we pull the orange line out, I just had this discussion at a meet break um, about a week ago, is that if we stretch out the orange line, that solves that, you know, all the way over to Oak Lawn. Yes. So that solves that transportation better. We solve the 31st Street bus. We create more traffic um, uh, buses along Archer and the <coughs> ancillary um, arteries. Um, that creates access to them. So whether you want to take public transportation to all of these great, um, uh, restaurants and, and salons and all the things that they may need um, and put this package together, then you're very powerful that way, right? I like that. And work with the transportation companies and the transportation nonprofits. Obviously, Metra and RTA are nonprofits, they're organizations. Um, but I think that is a really powerful way. That doesn't require legislation, but the legislation, because sometimes you solve problems legislatively, sometimes you do it through a business or a, or a marketing mm -hmm. uh, solution, right? I think that's the marketing and business side of it, the legislative side of it is that there should be some level of, um, I won't call it rent control, but re uh, a rent opportunity equalization for small businesses that are not chains, because right now the chains are full. And that is a piece of federal legislation that can be um, put together. That well would state. be really helpful, yeah. especially, I, that's a, a unique challenge to this area. Yeah. Just right. because of the proximity to the airport, you see a lot of those chains coming in. Yeah. All of a sudden, we have you know a Chili's and a Friday's and a, what, what happened? So you know, they got those yeah, it's yeah. interesting because O'Hare did this 30 years ago with a state law. Um, so my goal here is because we have so many different entities in this area, it's kind of a unique area. We have more lines of track in Illinois Free than any other um, district in the nation. Mm -hmm. So we would work with national um, railway companies uh, to get some of this achieved. But um, what I would say is that um, the combination of the business solution and the uh, legislative solution would bring more of a power house feel. We have all of the things that O'Hare does, we do. And yet, we're not bustling. Yeah. We need to be more bustling. Now, there are great, great, great businesses around here. It's just that the access to them is tricky. Well, and the word access, we keep coming back to, that's yeah. part of why the collective was founded, was because there was no access. There's no hub for everyone to get together and exchange this kind of information, which is why we invited you out today, because there's an exchange happening here. Here's what she's planning at a legislative angle. Here's what we're trying to do as a community. How do we bring those things together and actually have it happen? Right. Because those things can't exist in a silo. Right. And so now you've got people from different neighborhoods talking. You've got people from different branches of organization talking. And now something might actually happen. <laughs> which is how we might get that sort of bustling <coughs> O'Hare. Now, what we want to do differently from O'Hare is make sure that we don't have the congestion, we don't have the gentrification. And so that's what we need when we say purposeful growth, yeah. that we want to make sure that everybody is being represented. So it's really important that business owners come to these meetings and tell us what's going on, tell us these challenges, tell us these issues, so that we can then go, hey, this is a problem. And we have that pipeline to folks like Marie who can help us solve it, not just from a community angle, but from a law angle. Here's what we're gonna change, here's what needs to shift, here's what we need to do to support small businesses and not be the United States of change, yeah, basically, right? right, right? right. Um, the whole point is to be able to give people the ability to have that leg up, the American dream, right? right. I mean, we're all dreaming it. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because it's a tie in healthcare, education, and small businesses in one. I'm an academic advisor. I've been an academic advisor for almost 10 years now. I started at Bain College, and now I'm at Malcolm X. So seeing transportation go from, especially the Bull Orange Line, going all the way to Midway, where it alleviates the students who do not want to go on daily because they don't have access to the trains that allow them to go. That's exactly yeah. But when it comes to healthcare, one of the biggest things that I've seen, I grew up in a little village on 24th of Pulaski. There used to be a lot of small businesses. A small business, mechanic shop, now across the street, there's a, there's a Burger King, there, there's Altavita, mm -hmm. which I've seen for lack of